Join me for Reflections in Time. We're talking in the summer of 1982. And the program you're about to see, for whatever length it happens to run, is a very informal one with a friend of mine and a friend of many of you, or probably thousands of you. He's Lloyd Cardwell, and the program is Reflections in Time. Now, what I'm asking Cardi to do is he comes back to the campus where he worked and for so many, many years as part of our athletic program and faculty, is to reminisce and to reflect on the time that he spent here at the university from his point of view. The people, the programs, many of the things that he can recall that happened. It's a beautiful day, in fact, in the summer of 1982. Here as we sit in the stadium. Cardi, as you look out across the stadium, it looks a little different, doesn't it? What did it look like when oh, they first built it? It's hard to believe that this has developed as, as great and wonderful as it is today. Uh, when I first came here, you know, uh, there was only one main building and then two Quonset huts, and that was all. Over through here, well, the football field was here, yeah. but that was all, uh, just the football field. And there was a track around. So there. everything in back of us was just open. Oh, yeah, just open. In fact, uh, right down through here was a creek, ah, and uh, you had it. to jump over the creek to get on up the hill here. <laughs> and uh, I know uh, a lot of boys sometimes they jump over and they would be little snakes in the creek and so forth, and you'd hear them hollering, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, it really has changed. My goodness, you wouldn't believe it, uh, and if you hadn't seen it, you know, uh, from the time we started, what it is now. The year you came was 1946, am I right? Yes, yeah, September of 46. But I don't want to stop there. <laughs> a lot of us who have known you and worked with you and become your friend over the years know about you and your years here as the coach and football and track and as a part of our campus family. But I think, myself included, a lot of us don't know a lot about where you all hail from, Cardi. So well, let's go back a little bit in history. Where where are your roots? Well, Paul, I, I actually, uh, actually, I was born in, in Kansas, Republic City, Kansas, which is just over the border down here in Nebraska, around Superior, Nebraska, through there. And, of course, we skipped around a little bit. Uh, I've lived in Minnesota. You live on the farm or in town or what? Well, you might say on a farm because the town was only about 300, 350, <laughs> and you could step a little ways and you'd be out on a farm, yeah. you know. Yeah. But that was enjoyable time of year because we was always as kids, we were going hunting every day and swimming and fishing. And that's, I think, the way we kept in real great shape, you know, just sure. hunting and fishing. And, and so your athletic as life kid, started early. It really did. <laughs> Then, of course, see, after years went on, we moved to Seward, Nebraska. Did you go to high school there? Or? Yes, and that's where I went to high school at Seward, Nebraska. And uh, I was fortunate enough to get into sports there. And, and uh, then from there... Did you start playing football there? Yes, yes. In fact, I was fortunate enough, as I say, to make all state a couple of years What football. attracted you to football? Already at first. Why did you, why uh, did you play it? Any, any, I really, remember any reason why you did it? No, I really don't. Uh, Actually, uh, we used to kick, uh, as a kid, we used to kick the football around, you know, out in the street. But uh, I was pretty big for my age, and uh, the coach come up and says, Cardi, why don't you come out for football, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I was a freshman in uh, high school. So I thought, well, I'd just give it a try. So you were invited. Yeah, yes, you I was. Kidding. I had no intention to otherwise, but I was invited to, and I went home and talked to my folks about it. Mother didn't think it was a very good idea. Mothers often <laughs> don't, right? <laughs> right? But I went out anyway, and uh, that's where it started, right there at Seward, and then from there I went on to Nebraska. Were you always in the backfield? Yes, always was. Where'd uh, you get that nickname you acquired? Which was well, the horse, wasn't it? Uh, Wild Horse, yeah. Wild Horse Cardinal. Yeah. Fred yeah. Ware tacked that on to me when I was at Nebraska. Oh, is that right? Yeah. He, and uh, You had some great years in Nebraska, didn't you, Cardi? Well, yes, I had a lot of fun. Too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we went to Nebraska uh, in those yeah. days, and that was back in 33, 34, 35, 36, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was no scholarships or anything like that. No, you just none went like once, anybody else. None right? once ever. We just went there, paid our own way and uh, had to find jobs to get eat and find a place to live and all that. Well, of course, I think that was good because that made us appreciate uh, the sports. You really had and to work harder to be an athlete than the normal student, didn't you? <laughs> oh, my, yes. In those days, I held two jobs down just to go to school, one to eat and one to sleep, you might say. 
uh, uh, going to Nebraska. And travel for games took longer, so you really kept we, busy, didn't we you? We always traveled more by plane. I mean train. Right. There was no planes to speak of in those days. That, so a day or two ahead of the game and a day or so coming back? I that's suppose. right, yeah. Oh, we had some beautiful trips. We went out on Thanksgiving Day, went out to Oregon and played Oregon out there. We have had our own special train. Is that right? And oh my, did we have a lot of fun. Our own special train and, and of course a lot of uh, rooters went along with us. And we went out to Oregon, played Oregon and beat them 19 and 6 or something like that and came back. and. And it was just, we'll never forget the train trip, because it was great. You, well, speaking of remembering, as you think of your life as a college football player over at UNL, what are the things that really stand out that, that you enjoyed, the things that really were the biggest for you in, in football at that stage? Well, I, what I really enjoyed then was, you know, they had at that time what they call the knothole club. And that was uh, kids, they would set them down on the south uh, end or southwest end mm -hmm. or southeast end of the stadium, and they could get in for 25 cents. Yeah. And you know, that thing would just load up every ball game, and uh, we'd get all kinds of cheers. You know, they're the ones that pushed us on, those knot holes. Is that right? Oh, my. That name comes from kids looking through the fence at the ball game. Yeah, there, I think that's baseball yeah. or football. I think yeah. that's right. Yeah. And they said, well, all right, you kids, if you want to come in with just, it, I think it was up to 15 or 16 years old, something like that. For 25 cents, you can come in and have a seat. Well, that's where would, your strong rooters were. That's right. And they would root us on. And, and uh, I know the cheerleaders, they go over at the students over on the other side, the university students and they'd get their yells going, but they could go over the uh, knot hole and get twice as much noise as they could <laughs> get out of the other students. And really, it was just wonderful. We really enjoyed it. How about some runs, some touchdowns, some some big things that made a difference that you remember? Well, I don't know. I, You know, when I got out there on that field and things started going, you forget everything else but what's on the field. Right. Uh, and you were on I, the field a long time, too. Oh, well, there was no... Uh, you didn't have uh, uh, platooning. Oh, never, never. And, of course, the rules then were if you went out in a quarter, you couldn't come back in that same That's quarter. You, right. had to wait to, that. you had to wait to the, the second quarter, or if you went out the first, you had to wait the second quarter before you come back in or so. Even if you were injured? Even, yes. And so, uh, uh, well, I can remember we played Wyoming the first game. And I was playing safety, or in other words, clear back on a kickoff. Yeah. I, I took that ball, and I, I guess I was just scared to death because I run for a <laughs> touchdown. <laughs> what a great way to start! The first time I touched the ball, I run for a touchdown, and and uh, that was quite a thrill for me. Oh, you know, wow. as, as a yeah. as a sophomore. See, freshmen weren't allowed to no. play in those you days. You couldn't play so. as a freshman, could you? No. Did they no. have freshman ball? Yes, they like, did. They called they them. Uh, what did they call them? The Cornhuskers and uh, and. Uh, Oh, I don't know what it was. It was a second team. Nubbins. Ah, it was the Nubbins. And, that's you know, an appropriate one for the yeah, beginners. Huh? Yeah. Well, it's like we had here, uh, we had the Papooses along with yeah, the Indians, right, you know. Right. So that was the Nubbins down there. Well, so that they, first game with Wyoming, that must have been a great thrill. It gave you some, gave you some confidence that helped you on through, right? Yes, it certainly did. And, of course, uh, I was very fortunate. Went on the next three years and made all, all uh, conference yeah. all three years in a row and which was very fortunate because i had a whale of a lot of fine teammates you oh, know to, sure. to pull me through Remember some of the names that stick out you mentioned oh ones, yes elmer dorman was one he played in charlie brock played and and myers was center and, and a lot hubka oh there was a whale of a lot of them that uh, uh of course as i say uh, uh, hadn't been for them, I wouldn't have gone any place. <laughs> uh, what did you like playing best, offense or defense, since you had to do both? Well, I, I've thought of that a lot of times, uh, Paul. Which would I like to do? I, I would say uh, if you play defense, like in the pros now, you'd live longer than you would if you were offense, <laughs> as far as that's concerned. But I liked both of them. I really did. I enjoyed playing defense as well as offense. But, you know, you played uh, 60 minutes or so. I, there's many games I played 60 minutes. And uh, if you happen to be lucky enough to run a 40-yard uh, run, and then the next time you run another 30 yards for a touchdown, and they kick off, why, well, you, there's no way of going out and sit right, down. You right. just keep right on going. You needed to be in pretty good condition, didn't well, you? Well, yes. Yeah, we, we were in pretty good shape. You had to be in good shape. The game was different, though, too, wasn't it? Oh, right? yeah, sure it was. What are some of the main differences then? Well, I think platoon, platoon is making, uh, yeah, because, you know, our game when we were playing was that uh, you started in 
you were pretty, well, we say lively, you weren't tired or anything, right. but as the game went along, you got tireder and tireder. And of course, that goes with both sides, both teams. So the game sort of slowed down, slowed huh? Slowed down. By the time of the fourth quarter, it was slowed down too much. Hitting, hitting just as hard, but you were hitting slower and moving slower. And the passing game wasn't as extensive, was no, it? No, no. The passing game, uh, oh, if you threw 15, 10 passes a game, why, that was considered pretty good. Wasn't you know? the football a slightly different shape, too? Oh, yeah, it was fatter. It was like a pumpkin in so a way. So a little harder to pass, Yes, huh? you couldn't grip it as well uh, to pass. But no. good for the drop kick, huh? Oh, yeah, for the, the punters and the drop kickers. Did you ever have a drop kicker? Uh, not not in high school or in college. I did. We had a drop kicker in pros. Uh -huh. Dutch Clark was yeah, a I remember. real fine drop kicker. What an art pros. that was. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Dutch could step back there and kick a 30 and 40 yard drop kicker. Wow. So your college days were lots of fun. Oh, yes, I really enjoyed it. I look back on it, I think, my goodness. You know, I, I think now and then, how they holler now, we uh, we didn't have any meals. We uh, There was no meal training tables, table, training anything tables like or anything like that. We, of course, we had no scholarships or anything, so it, 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 we weren't forced to go out and play football. We went out and played football because we liked to play. And we didn't have these here uh, uh, chalk talks for hours at a time and all this. We just went out and everything. practice, and, yeah. and uh, when practice was over, with, everybody would take off for their jobs. They had part-time jobs and so forth. So it uh, it was a lot different. And uh, but I think we enjoyed it as much, or maybe more, because uh, uh, the coaches wouldn't uh, pressure you and and try to because. As I say, you're there on your own, yeah. and you're not get, given anything, but you're there for pride, and you wanted to have the best team that you could possibly have. Right. And uh, nobody had to really push us. And, uh, but nowadays, they just live football from morning to night. And of course, I don't think I could do that. It's year-round, too. Yes, right? and I don't think I could do that. I don't think I'd get up in the morning thinking football, and all-day football, and then even nights in the meetings, football. And, all it, it, it would take it out, it would take the fun out of it. You I know, think. in those years, Cardi, as I recall, lots of young men, and perhaps some women too, uh, were more than one sport kind of athletes. It oh. was common. Oh, Three yes. and four sports. You see a man with a lot of stripes on his leather sweater. Sure. Maybe baseball, football, maybe track, mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, did you get into anything other than football? Oh, yes. I, uh, after football was over with, we had indoor track, and then after indoor track was. Uh, outdoor track so I kept busy all the way around now of course a good friend of mine went to school together in in Seward Elmer Dorman mm -hmm. <coughs> who became your teammate me. yeah who was a teammate at Seward and yeah. then come on into into Nebraska he played football basketball baseball and track wow and he lettered in all four of them and I think he's probably one of the only four uh, one uh, very few that has lettered four times at Nebraska, and of course that's all impossible now. Now, okay. athletes like yourself and the man you just mentioned, when you came to a place like Nebraska, or any other Big Tens or Big Six, Big Eight school in those days. It was Big Six in our days. Was it Six? Yeah, Big Six, yeah. 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 Uh, they didn't give you scholarships, you came on your own, but when you got there, did you have sort of an easy run of it with the classes, or did you take the sort of normal things everybody else took? Oh, we had to take every, every of course, we had to work towards degrees like everybody else. And there's what did you major in, for certain, example? Uh, physical education. Uh -huh. and, and, uh, so, uh, you decided you wanted to be a coach. That's day. right. I, I thought, well, I liked the, the sports and everything, and I thought I'd just stay right with it and, and take it up in physical education. And uh, so I stayed right with it, but I didn't get my degree till years later. Uh -huh. <laughs> I got all of it about 14 hours, which I picked up after I come back. Well, it was really pretty tough with the jobs and the travel and the schedules to take many hours at a time, wasn't it? Well, yes. Uh, of course, as I say, they didn't uh, demand so much uh, football out of us and so forth right. as they do now. But uh, we still had to have our part-time jobs or we couldn't be going to school. You know, we're coming to the end of the first segment of Tape Cardi, so we'll pause here a minute and let them reload the, the camera, and then we'll be back together again, okay? All right, Paul. So we're late, mid to late 30s, yeah. then, about that, and how they got them. When we finished the first, when we finished our first segment of tape for our reflections in time, Cardi and I were talking about uh, his life at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, and so we'll pick it up right there as we go through the life story of this fine man, Cardi. Uh, 
you had played football now for three years. Your eligibility was over. And something else big happened in your life about that time, right? Well, yes. I, I got I graduated in 1937, mm -hmm. spring of 37. Mm -hmm. My life football was 36 and so forth. And, of course, I had been going with this gal I got now, Beth, mm -hmm. uh, for about a year prior to that. And so after we got out of school, uh, I got a pro contract. And to sign the contract, I got $250. <laughs> Boy. Is that called a bonus? And I was a, a drafted first, too, you know, yes, and first right. drafter. And uh, so I got a bonus of $250. So I said to Beth, I says, shall we, would you marry me? Well, she thought it over a little bit and then finally said, well, sure. So we got married on that $250. And of course, I had a contract to go to uh, Detroit Lions. So I had a job. Uh -huh. So we got married on that and took our honeymoon up in uh, Estes Park and came back. And I'm sure glad she accepted me because she stabilized me, you might say. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you, I don't know what I'd have done without her. She, uh -huh. she stuck with me through thick and thin. And we went through an awful lot of uh, hard times. And uh, she sat on many of bleachers year after yeah. year after year, from high school to college to pros to to coach in here, you know. She's always in the bleachers. I don't think she ever missed. Wonderful. Yeah. Now, uh, along that, as long as we're pausing there, you can put the family in any place that comes along. You have a namesake in your family, yes, too. Yes, yes. We had a boy about, well, that was four years later. I see. Uh, he was born in Detroit in 41. And we got married in 37, 38, 9, 4, back about four years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in 41. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he was a premature baby. Uh, he only weighed, uh, no, about five pounds or less when he was born, and, and of course we had to leave him in the hospital. Bill, he er, in the hospital for about seven days because of incubator. Then he come out of that and, and come along real fine, and uh, he got real fat. So I started call, calling him Butch because he was so <laughs> fat and, and plump, you know. And I just started calling him Butch, and that kind of stuck with him ever since. Is that right? Yeah. You know, there's a story I'd like to have you put in here. Uh, I think we've passed it in terms of the chronology of activity, but before we go to pro football, which I really want to take up next, um, you not only were a football player, that's what we know you're for and a coach, but you were quite active in track. In fact, you had a chance to go to the Olympics, but it all went down well, the drain one summer, right? Yes, uh, of course I was uh, a leader in, at that time in the, in the long jump, well they call it broad jump at that time, right, but right. it's long jump now, and in the hurdles, high and low hurdles, then sprinted a little bit uh, all, three, all three years that I was in track there. Mm -hmm. But I uh, started in, I didn't have a uh, uh, triple jump in those days in Nebraska or in the big eight or six at that time. But I asked Henry Scholey, who was my coach, I said, how far do you have to go uh, to be recognized in the, in the uh, triple jump? And he said, oh, around 45 feet. I said, oh, I can do that. And right out there on the football field, because it was grass at that time, yeah. I, I went 45 feet. Wow. And so he said, oh, boy. And he entered me in the Texas Relays and the Kansas Relays and Drake. And I was fortunate enough to win two out of the three of them. Right. That. And that moved you on into the Olympic picture. Yes, and uh, we had uh, tryouts in Chicago, and uh, I got second in Chicago in the triple jump. And then we went on into Princeton because the next week was Princeton. Uh, that was a warm up. Then into Randall's Island the next week for the final tryouts for the Olympics. Uh -huh. Well, in Princeton, we were there about four days, and, and we had that preliminary meet, and I pulled a hamstring. Uh -huh and it just pulled me out. I went into New York and tried. I taped my leg up as best I could and took one jump because I knew that's all I had in me was one jump. And you know, that hung up to the last last jump of three boys. And yes, they beat right. me and, and uh, they beat me out of the Olympics. So Boy. almost. This yeah, was, almost, but not, yeah. not there. This was the 1936 Olympics? Yes. Mm -hmm. mm, weren't they the ones that were held in Germany? That's right. Where the Sam Francis. Jesse Owens. Yeah, Sam Francis was a shot putter, and he made it. Uh -huh. And uh, when we went out there, everybody thought I'd make it, but he wouldn't. And it turned around the other way, you know. Well, that, health got in the way. Well, yeah, sure. But Sam like was a left, would have made it. left footed, or left footed. Well, he was left footed, but a left handed shot putter, too, at the time, which was rare. But he he, he got third and, met, and went to the Olympics. 
Now that's when Hitler was there that year, mm -hmm. and Jesse Owens. Yes. You know Jesse Owens wins the 100 and the 220 and on the relay and yes. so forth, and Hitler wouldn't even recognize him. That's right. right there. There's yeah. a big story relative to that that went on for many many years. Yeah, we lost Jesse here not too long yes. ago. It's yeah. just too bad. He was a great person. In the summer of 1982, as we look to the fall, one of the things that often comes up is the size and the quality of professional football. The tremendous <laughs> salaries that young men are making in the National Football League. Well, Cardi, you were telling us a while ago that you were drafted by the Detroit Lions and they gave you $250 for signing. That's right. It was different in those days. It was still hurt and you got hit hard, but it was different. Tell us all you can about those years in pro football. Well, uh, you go back into those years, and of course that was 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, in those years when I played. <coughs> Excuse me, they were only I think eight teams or nine teams in the league. They only had one league, National Football League. Weren't divisions. There was no, one there was no divisions or anything, and and uh, no platoon systems or anything. If you, in one one year, I played uh, seven out of the nine games, 60 minutes in pro oh, wow. football. Uh, the, the fellow that I was alternating with, he knocked his shoulder down and never got back, and there was only two people for each position at that time. You had basically 22 people on the yeah, team. That's just about it. So. Uh, I had to play it, play it out, and uh, I'll tell you, there was times when I didn't know that I was going to get back on the field uh, the next the next Sunday after we got through the Sunday before that, because you have to play 60 minutes in those games, it gets a little rough. And of course, then we had one game, we played Washington, or we played uh, Chicago Bears one on a Thursday, and then on a Sunday, uh, Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving on thing. and then on a Sunday we'd play another game. Well, Lord, I played on Thursday 60 minutes, and I didn't even hardly get out of bed for the Sunday game, you know, but <laughs> boy, that was just really too close. But we, uh, it was a hard struggle in those days. We didn't know really whether we were going to get paid or not. Uh, it was just something, it was just getting started. We felt like the Indians had settled this country and, and yeah. they come along and took it away from them. <laughs> what, what kind of money did you make? Well, I signed up for $175 a game. Oh, paid by the game? Paid by the game. I got 250 or 275 to sign a contract. Then I got 175 a game. Then I made pro all pro for two years, and I finally bounced it up to about 275 to three and a quarter, and, and making all pro, and that's what I got. Yeah. So uh, well, a great honor, but a little more money involved, yeah. really. <laughs> yeah. Well, well in those what, days, that wasn't such bad money. I'm just going to say, no, it wasn't. Uh, when I was going to Nebraska, we slipped back to Lincoln. Uh, we could buy six hamburgers for a quarter right. in the sack, you know. Right. So you can see money was uh, uh, a little different then yeah. than it is now. Uh, but uh, even at that, uh, trying to get a quarter, you know, you, if you got a job that paid you 30 cents to 35 cents an hour, was considered a pretty good job. The year. What. Uh, what sort of money did you get for playing professional football? We think of the salaries today that are astronomical. What did you get Carly, well, back in the 30s? There? I kind of hate to mention when I think what they get now. And well, it was we worth getting. a lot more then. Well, yes, it was, but not like it is. No, I mean, no, when no. you're talking about three quarters of a million or a million dollars a, a yeah. year, yeah. we're talking you about... You hired the whole team and then some for that for more than one year. Oh, yeah, for four or five years, yeah. you know. Right. We were paying... Well, I got... Uh, I was receiving $175 a game when I first started, and I was picked number one draft choice on top of it, see, yes. and I got 175 a game. But then uh, as we went on, I made all pro for a couple of years, yeah. and then I bounced up to about three and a quarter, 375 a game. But we only had 11 games, you know, figure that out, 11 games, uh, you're only making 35 to $4,000 a year. But still, yeah. in those years, a salary of $4,000 was for a few months work was pretty good, wasn't it? It sure was, because I bought a new car, a new Buick. I paid $900 for it, brand new, see, yeah, yeah. right off the line. What so. did you do in the off-season? Well, I worked uh, I worked in Detroit in the personnel department. I was head, uh, I, I was did all the hiring and firing. So you made your home there in Detroit? Yes, yes, we stayed right there in Detroit. Mm -hmm. I worked for the American Metal Products Company there as personnel director. And I did all the hiring and the firing and took care of the first aid and, and insurances and stuff like that. That was during the summer. And then, of course, that went on for a couple of years. And then my boss says, well, uh, uh, I think you better quit football and just take this over. Of course, I, I worked uh, the year round there, but I had to go over at night 
and work after football and so forth. Mm -hmm. So the job went on regardless. Yes, of the so I went over there, but it was getting pretty tough. I did all my hiring in the evening and uh, see all my foremen and so forth, see what they needed and all this and that. But that was getting pretty complicated, and I would be over there at 2 o'clock in the morning and so forth. So the boss says, well, you'd better give up football and take this. Well, I didn't really want to give up football at that time. No. Which was in 40, 41. So I thought, well, if i got to give it up, I'm going to stick with football for a while, which was a bad mistake. I should have I should have stayed with the job. But, you know, when you get in sports and so forth, you get it, you just start, you don't do things like you should do. You just stay with the sport. Oh, so. it's easy to have hindsight, isn't it? Well, it sure is. Uh, <laughs> goodness. Then I got jammed up and broke my leg and got my cheek all caved in. I'm, I'm thinking about this boy in baseball. I got hit in the cheek. In 1982 here. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's in the College World Series. Series. Right. He got hit there. Man, that was bad. Well, I got hit in the same spot with a knee come up and hit me and smashed my uh, cheek in. And of course, I went to the Henry Ford Hospital, and they looked it all over, and they ended up getting a specialist, a dentist. I couldn't figure what a dentist was doing there. They had a skull specialist and everything. They drilled some holes above and below and put wire, put uh, rubber bands, and they wanted to draw the face out gradually. And I, here I am, hungry. I'm, there's nothing wrong with me physically other than my face. I'm just hungry as a dick and can't eat. Maybe. All I could do is suck through a straw, some soup, and so forth. Well. It ended up, uh, when they put those rubber bands on, I uh, went home that night. I didn't want to stay in the hospital. About 2 o'clock in the morning, I woke up, and my teeth were just killing me. So, boy, I was back to the hospital the next morning, bright and early, waiting for that dentist. And when he come in, he says, don't say anything, Cardi. He says, I know what happened. I said, what happened? He says, your teeth were aching and pulling. And I says, yes. I said, I had to take the bands off. He says, it's a good thing you did, or you'd have pulled your teeth out. <laughs> oh. So I had to alternate then. I Every two or three hours, I'd put those bands one way, and then, and then alternate them two hours and put them the other way. So we gradually and pulled that out. Well, I have a funny feeling yet. All my nerves are shot and so forth in through Over here. the right yeah. eye. If they go in there and start uh, fixing this tooth and give me some Novocaine or something to, to deaden the nerve, it'll deaden the whole side of my face. <laughs> well, football in those days was a really tough sport, wasn't it? Well, sure it was. Uh, well, it's tough now, but it was tough then, too. We didn't have the equipment they've got now. Oh, how the equipment's say, changed. They wouldn't wear the helmet that we wore now. I mean, it was just kind of a flimsy old thing you stuck on your head and that in fact, once in a while a guy wouldn't wear one right well yes we had a player that uh, we didn't pittsburgh had a player that didn't wouldn't wear a helmet and uh, of course they passed the law later yes. on that you had to wear helmets and of course and they improved them so much too. oh yes how and about then, the hip pads shoulder pads other parts of the gear oh yeah we had big old thick hip pads in fact i don't want a big old thick hip pads because when they hit you you know yes uh, but now they're real light they're, they're, they're just as strong or stronger than we had only they're four times as light than we are than we had at that time. So the equipment really has changed. Of course, the equipment in all sports has changed so much now. You know, like you said, the football the football was round and fat. Now it's it was thin, and you can hang on to it. Where did that pass. change come about? Oh, I would say <coughs> in the late 30s or early 40s, somewhere in there, when they really changed the diameter. Was the idea to improve the passing game? Yes, maybe? definitely was. I, I'm sure of that. And of course, it made it tougher on the kickers, and so forth. But it made it easier on hang, hanging on to the ball mm -hmm. and passing the ball. Uh, it's just like carrying a balloon around; it's hang, hard to hang on to. But if you get something that's a little severe that you can grab and hang on to, it isn't half as bad. It probably had a lot to do with the change in the philosophy of the game. Oh yes, yes. You got in. They started a lot more passing. Sammy Ball went in the same time I did. Well, Sammy was noted for his great passing and the Redskins, and then of course. Uh, Hinkle, Carl Hinkle, and I was at Green Bay, and and then at uh, at uh, at the Bears, it all started a lot more. Sid Luckman and people uh, like yes, that. Yes, they they started doing a lot of. We're out of another segment of tape here, so we're gonna have to cut it, <laughs> Cardi, and pause for a little bit. And when we come back, we'll in the stadium in the summer of 1982, Cardi. And as you look out around you, I imagine it brings a lot of memories. And in the background, we can hear some of the young men who are going to play football this fall in the pros and here on the campus, running up and down the in the stadium steps. Uh, as you go back to 1946 now, if you will, think of uh, your first remembrance of this campus. People, places, whatever. What was well, it like? I, to start with, I worked out here in the personnel department uh, at the uh, bomber plant. Mm -hmm. And then after that closed down, I was looking around and I 
uh, got a job in, in Denver. Oh, uh, in the Gates Rubber Company, ah. yeah, as, a, as an uh, uh, advisor, and uh, not an advisor more or less, but as, a, as an instructor there. And then Virgil Elkin took over here as athletic director. Yeah. And he called me and asked me if I would take the coach's job here of, of both football and track. Well, I said yes, I jumped at the opportunity. So we came back here in 46. So actually we started in September of 46, but we had no equipment, no nothing. See, they, they shut this down here, sports, in, in the world, Second World War. They really didn't have football. Four or five years, they the didn't have colleges. any sports at all, see, for about four years or five. So we started it up again. I come in here in September of 46. Well, there was no shoes, no helmets, no nothing. What there was was just rottened out, you might say. It was no good. So we had to start from scratch in 46. So we had no team. We just got some boys out and practiced on the field and so forth. But they had no schedule, no team or anything. Mm -hmm. Just kind of scrimmage them up. Kind of hard to get things going then. Yeah, well, was the first thing was trying to get shoes. You know, shoes in those days was hard to get. Uh, Russell Sporting Goods was lucky. It was Well, we were lucky that they give us a little allotment out of some other people's uh, allotment that we got some shoes there. And so 47 was the first year that we started fielding the team then. Okay, and uh, what what uh, sort of numbers did you have? Uh, what was it oh, like in 47? Well, what kind of teams did you play? We had uh, a lot of GI boys uh, of the Second World War and so forth that, uh, that wanted to play football that never played football, but they got larger and so forth so mm -hmm. they come out and try. So we had, oh, I would say 45 or 50 boys. Did that, you? Yeah, you know, they'd come out and, uh, and uh, tried out for the football team. Well, goodness sakes, in fact, we had some very fine boys that made all, uh, that made all city and all state and so forth to come out. And uh, I think we mentioned a while ago, Simon H. Simon mm -hmm. and Ed Baker and Bill Engelhart and Steck and Hahn and Rudy Rotel, all those boys were all state boys. Now for boys like that, you back in the 30s got no scholarship help, no assistance. How about these young men? Did they get a little bit of help? No, uh, help we had no school? scholarships, no nothing here. Uh, and the only reason I was fortunate enough to get those boys, they had the GI Bill. See, so they were able to come. They, to they had, for they free. had uh, well, not free. They oh. they had their meals to take care yeah. of, the board oh, yeah. and their room but and their everything. Tuition. But their tuition, more or less, was kind of taken care of by the GI Bill. So oh, you didn't do much in the way of real recruiting in those days. You took what came. No, we just had to, we tried to recruit, just tried to sell the school, how, what a great education you can get here, and which you could, and so forth and so on. But that's about all in our facilities. Well, we had no, this uh, this wasn't here, see. Yeah, what was here? That, well, alfalfa field and, uh, and going up a hill here and so forth. Uh, this wasn't here at all. All we had was a football field. We played our football for two years at Benson High School. Is that right in the old Benson High School yeah, Stadium? Yeah. I don't know then, but yeah, yeah. Where they still, still there. there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's where we played our football the first two years. And you practiced out in this area? Yeah. We but couldn't even practice on the field. We had to practice up here by Dodge on the, uh, on the long field up there. When did you finally move out to this area? Well, when uh, we built this this uh, field house built in 49. Uh -huh. And I think we went into it in September of 49. Wow, that was a tremendous change, wasn't oh, it? Oh, my, yes. We could play at home, you know, and had a nice field house here and a nice stadium. And, uh, yeah, we started playing here in 49. You know, one of the things about football, and they used to talk about in my early years here, and it came on through the 50s, you know, about having lights at this stadium. Well, we didn't have them. And no. can you tell us why? Well, I think one reason is that uh, the neighbors around here didn't want lights. Mm -hmm. they, they said it would cause a lot of noise and disturbance uh, in the evening around here, and the lights would reflect over onto their lawns or this and that. And actually, that was the, the big reason why uh, mm -hmm. they, they didn't want lights here, because of the crowd that might disturb things around through here. Now, as you described it to us earlier, Cardi, the game you played at you know, <coughs> University of Nebraska and with Detroit, with the Lions, was a different kind of football game than we play in 1982, or that you played, really, in 1947, 8, 9, 50, and so on. Now. Uh, what are some of the differences? What was the game like in those days when you first began coaching here? Well, uh, we didn't have uh, platoon systems or anything like that, as far as that's concerned. And our big problem was to get the right kind and good equipment to start with. Then, of course, naturally, the, to get the players. Well, yeah. we started getting the players real good. They started coming in. Well, I can name some names, like Bill Green. Mm -hmm. You know, he's on the board now. And, uh, uh, old Rudy Rotella, Ed Baker, and, you know, 
I hate to mention names because I, there were so many of them well, that were so good. Mention the ones you think of. Well, and uh, sure. but you know, at one time I had uh, I think it was six or seven sets of brothers. Playing. Didn't you bring a note along so you yeah. could remember them? Why didn't you? Yeah. Just, that's very interesting. Well, not too uh, usual anymore, but sets of brothers. Well, I had uh, Harry and Larry Johnson. You know, and they were great uh, with a center and tackle, and they and they were in their own right all Americans, you mm -hmm. might say, and, and all states. What year about were they? Well, they were around the fifties. Uh huh. And then I had the Keith and Dick Christie. Now Keith was a quarterback and Dick was a fullback, and you couldn't find any better at that time. They were great, and uh, they come over here from Shenandoah from Iowa, and uh, Keith was a quarterback, as I say, and Dick fullback. And uh, there's quite a story about that, you know, they were playing together. I mean, it was on the same team. And Dick got pretty well beat up the game before that, and I think he had a bad arm and a few things, and, and Keith was playing, and a quarterback, and they started getting rough with Keith, and I think somebody maybe hit Keith or something a little too hard, and Dick was sitting beside me on the bench, and when they did that, Dick jumped up and he's going to go out and help his brother and I grabbed him and I said what do you think you can do out there you can't hardly get along yourself you know <laughs> but uh, they were protective in many ways and then of course we had Charlie and Frankie Mancuso oh, well, I think yeah. everybody knows the Mancusos and Charlie and well of course Dick Christie was over at Tech for so many oh, years among yeah. other things yeah yeah and, and Keith is coaching over now he has been for years is he? yeah and then we've got Ed and Howard Baker uh -huh. of course Ed Baker he went with Phillips 66 when he got out and Howard is in the insurance business but Howard played in, and, and Ed played tackle. And uh, if we had been in a conference, we never were in a conference. If we had been in a conference, all these boys I'm talking about would have made all conference, along with mm -hmm. some of them made all Americans. That was tough, not having a league attached to well, it, wasn't it? Yes, you well, had nothing to shoot for. All you had to shoot for was undefeated seats, yeah. too, because we had no conference. In fact, I think Al won the conference one year here when he was coaching. He, he, uh, he won four and lost five and still won the conference. Is that right? Yeah, so that's just, <laughs> but he beat the four teams that was yeah, in the conference, yeah. and that was it, see? Yeah. So, but then we go to Ed and Howard Baker, then we go to Ron, uh, Russ, and, and Don Gorman. They were brothers, uh, and uh, uh, Don was more or less of a, a, what we call a blocking back at that time, and Russ was center, as played center, and played tackle. And they were too fine, I mean, you couldn't find them any better. Russ was made all-American tackle or all conference tackle anywhere if we'd have had that. And he was on our staff for many years? Yes. He was up in Mankato State. <laughs> well, no, he moved from Mankato oh, State now. He's over in Illinois. He's the head of the Department of Physical Education ah. and so forth. Yeah. And now uh, uh, Jerry and Dick Tannehill. Now, there was two boys that a uh, strong wind would blow them away. <laughs> but uh, they had more heart to them than anybody. They loved to play football, and they didn't care how big they were. They'd tie into them. And, uh, and really, they were quick and fast, and, and I could uh, and did a tremendous job for me. Then we had uh, uh, Bill and uh, Bar. Well, of course, I'm going into that. Uh, about six brothers mm -hmm. that I had planned that were brothers, and then I had some boys that were brothers that was on track, such as Bob and Bill Barnes and Willie. Well, Willie Bob and his brother Johnson. And you can remember Willie Bob. He was quite a boy, and his brother was a hurdler. But his brother quit school after a year or two, but Willie Bob stayed right in there, and he ran the quarter and so forth when they in track. But he, uh, he was a great football player, too. So we had a lot of brothers. Well, I think we're out of tape again, so we'll pause for a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, we're actually... When we think of football in the 50s and 60s, and at least the early years of my life, uh, I think of the single wing and I think of the T formation and variations. When you played your football, when you coached your football, well, pick it up all the way through. What were the formations that you used down through years as a player and as a coach? Well, as a player, I was always a single wingman in mm -hmm. high school, in college, and in pros. I was always a single wingman, and I was a wingman on the single wing all the time. So naturally, I was pretty well embedded in single wing, and so I used that and used a single wing uh, when I started coaching. The basic philosophy of that was basically what, yeah. Cardi? Well, uh, well, basically, is I, that's what I knew the best. Yeah. And uh, I was pretty well familiar with the line and, and all those. And I had a center snap back to yeah. someone in the backfield, that's didn't right. I? That's mm right. -hmm. And uh, so I just worked from there and added new plays that, uh, that I thought would work and did work at times. And, and I think it pulled us through in pretty good shape at times, although a single wing is a little slow compared to the T 
in materializing to hit that line. It takes a little longer to get to but the line. But if you do then. your faking right and so forth, why, it'll still work for you, although you're a little late getting into the line at times. And that's when we did put a little key in later on to work with the single wing. But see, everybody was going to the T, so when they ran up against us with a single wing, they actually didn't know how to defense it. Mm. So that was, that so was to our advantage, yes, at that time. Who were, or what, rather, were the colleges and universities that you played rather regularly in those years when we weren't attached to any conference? Well, uh, we always played Washburn mm -hmm. and Morningside, and we had Idaho State on our schedule. We put Wayne of Detroit on our schedule a couple, three times. And we had Bradley on our schedule, which always had a good football team in those days. And we played uh, New Mexico State and, and uh, Northern Illinois. We played them about every year. Mm -hmm. And they're a Class A-1 school, you know, now. And so is Wayne State. And so is a few others that we played. Yeah. But, uh, oh, we never, uh, never had what you call an easy schedule at any one time. We always had uh, Idaho State as a Class A school now. One, uh, and it should have been, it would have been in those days when we played them. But uh, we never had an easy schedule at all. But uh, the boys never played too good when we had a weak schedule or a weak team. They always played real fine, though, when we went against a, a top team. Bradley came in here undefeated, and we beat them. Did you? You know, uh, Idaho State come in here undefeated, and we beat them. And, uh, By then, you were playing your games out here all yes, the time. Yes, we were playing out here at that time, you know. But we got grass stains, and we got mud at times, didn't we? <laughs> yes. But you know that field took it real good out there. That it was, it was so that it would drain good, and and it didn't take long for it to dry, even though it was grass at that time. And of course, Jack would never let that grass get low. It oh, was Jack. Uh, uh, Jack Edwards. He was the maintenance man yes. at that time. He he took a job uh, later on. He moved to Houston, down there, U University of Houston, and uh, was a maintenance man down there and so forth. And I didn't see Jack go because he did. He kept these, he kept everything up to shape here. And uh, that grass was always three inches tall, and he never cut it any lower than that, you know. <laughs> oh. So we knew how to run it. You, you take some of those boys, if they had fast boys coming in here, why? They thought they were in a wheat field. Yeah. <laughs> they, they didn't run quite as fast <laughs> as they thought they could, you know, in that tall grass. But, but uh, oh, the kids just loved it. It was just like a cushion out there. You know, when we practice up here in cinders and, and hard dirt and hard ground, Man, when they got on that field, they had nothing stopped them. They could just dive and tackle yeah. and everything else. Like playing on a mattress. Oh, yes. They really enjoyed it. Now, in your years as coach, and I think it continues today, there's sort of a fraternity in a way, relationship among all the coaches that you meet and greet. How are some, who were some of the coaches that well, uh, were in your league in terms of time, in that frame of reference that we've been talking about yeah. in the 50s and 40s? Uh, Washburn had a coach down there by the name of God Love that was there for years. And we always seemed to, he'd win a game and we'd win. It just kind of. Pretty even. Every even, every, every year. Always win the home game? Yeah. They're the ones that beat us uh, in 55 and when we had one defeat. We went down to Washburn and, and uh, doggone it, we had the game won with a minute and a half left to play and their punter was going to punt. And he was on about the 45-yard line, and he fumbled a pump and the punt and run around in for a touchdown. Oh! And that broke our string of 16 consecutive ball games by that. And then we had a minute left to play, and we took that ball on the kickoff, run it back to the middle of the field, and run one down for 20 yards, and time run out. So uh, I think we'd had a minute more, we'd have scored. But uh, we just woke up. Is that know. about as long a winning streak as we've ever had? Yes, I think it is. 16, 16 games. That's mm -hmm. a season and then some. Yes, it really is. Of course, in those days, eight and nine games is all you ever yeah. played. Yeah. Now See, they play 10 and 11. Cardi, we're running out of tape again, so we're going to take a pause here and then come back for a little while and wind things up. All right. All right. We've been visiting for a good part of an hour now with my friend and friend of many of you that may watch this at the Alumni Association or over in our library, Lloyd Cardwell, who was our coach for so many years here in the areas of football and track, along with teaching and relating to literally thousands of students. Cardwell, like so many people in our reflections in time, left a real mark on this university as it grew and continued to grow and change into the 1960s, 70s, and of course the 80s. Cardi retired just a few years ago, but he still maintains a relationship with the university, and he'll maintain a continuing relationship with the friends of the university and the historians as we look at this tape, and I want to thank Cardi so much for joining me for another Reflections in Time.
that you worked with here at the university. Uh, one thing I wish you'd mention are some of the coaches that helped you as a head coach for football for so many years. There's some real names there, too. Oh, yes. You know, we're talking about brothers here a while back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I had, uh, I got, fortunate. I got Charlie Brock in here in uh, 48, I believe it was. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, of course, Charlie come in and t as a line coach for me. And uh, uh, he one year, he, he was my line coach, and was getting, we were just doing great. And then Green Bay wanted him back in Wisconsin. So they offered him a job back there, and so he went back to Green Bay. Oh, did he? Charlie did. Yeah, and then, of course, his brother, Tom, uh, was at uh, New Hampshire, and uh, he kind of wanted to come back, so we hired Tom to come back. And, of course, Tom did a whale of a job for me for years. Yes, years, he was know. here quite a while. Wasn't and he? He, he was a workhorse. He Not only did he teach kinesiology and all those, but he was... Uh, a line coach and at one time uh, acting athletic director and uh, well, he just was working all the time it seemed like we we very seldom had too many meetings as coaches because everybody was working one way or the other we couldn't hardly get together but there was a set of brothers you might say in the coaching we had back here then of course uh, Ernie Gore we got him in as a, as an end coach yes and then he took over the beat time and Don Flasher was with us at the time and uh, of course, uh, that pretty well takes care. We know we only had two or three coaches. You didn't have a big staff. No, no. Uh, well, I'd say three at the most, and then, of course, one of those had to take care of what we call the Papooses at that time. We were the Indians, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, our B team was the Papooses. And I kind of, my wife kind of called them the Papooses, you know. <laughs> she kind of makes me a nose. And uh, I always hated that we lost the name Indians because I always thought that was fine. Uh, but one of those things that happened. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But, uh, no, and then, of course, when I first started, Harold Jonk was my line coach. Yeah. And, of course, Harold was an old uh, athlete here in, in Omaha U, you might say, at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. and then Harold became my line coach, and Flasher was helping me at that time. And then Harold took over basketball. Oh, yeah. That's when I got Charlie. After Harold took over basketball, uh, Harold Jonk took over basketball and physical education and so forth. Then, then I got Charlie in here. Then after Charlie, it was Tom. How big were your squads generally? 40, 50, 60 oh, as the season started? Yes. Well, you see what happened. Uh, nobody, we were here and there was no tuition, no help, no anything. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of boys, and I mean a lot of them, that doubled up and tripled up in sports. Mm -hmm. When they got through with football, we had four or five that played basketball. And those that didn't play basketball, a lot of them would wrestle. Mm -hmm. And those that, and then we had them that played the baseball. We, I was looking at uh, some of the schedules. And here with six and seven boys who were playing baseball that was played football. So we had a lot of boys. It was two and three sport boys. Uh, and, of course, uh, not having any tuition help or anything like that, they chose their sports and, and went and played. I couldn't say, all right, now, John, you've got to stay football here. You can't go off of that or this. Uh -huh. Because you'd probably tell me, well, the heck with you, coach. I'm going to play basketball, and then I'm going to play baseball yeah. or something like that. We had fine golf teams here and fine tennis teams here, and great coaches on the golf and tennis team. We even had a hockey team here. Oh, what, what, about what years were uh, Oh, we're the talking about 48, 49, 50, and mm -hmm. through there. Uh, they had a league, a hockey league around through town here, and, uh, and we had a real fine hockey league. Uh, we might call it a club league now here, yeah, yeah. but uh, we had a hockey league here. And, as I said, real top golf. So there were a variety of sports, really. Oh, yes. And the had. boys went out for almost all of them. All of them, yeah. Oh, the, the real athletes, the real good athletes. Well, like take Joe Arenas. Mm -hmm. Now, Joe, he came here in 49, 48. Joe was a good tailback, uh, a real fine football player. Then he went into basketball, lettered in basketball. Then he went into track, and he run track, and then he played baseball. So there was a four-sport boy. And right on into there. the pros. And the best thing in the world was to keep him busy anyway. Uh -huh. you know? <laughs> <laughs> but he was a real fine boy and a real good athlete. Well, you know, he signed with the 49ers yes. after he got out of they school. Had a, had a fine career with and him. And had a nice career with the 49ers at that time. When you think back off over the hundreds of games that you coached from the sidelines that you didn't play in, uh, do you remember some that really stand out, some tremendous wins or some uh, losses that really bug you still as you, you know, think back over them? As I was coaching, you mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah, my goodness sakes. Uh, Northern Illinois beat us in the last minute here, uh, 27 to 26. Oh. Yeah, uh, they beat us, well, it was the last 30 seconds. They intercepted the, 
uh, not intercepted. They caught a pass on the goal line, fell over the goal line, with only a seconds left to play, beat it 27 to 26. And they had a great record that year, and they should never beat it. That was a very disappointing one. Of course, uh, of course, the outstanding one, as far as I'm concerned, is when we won the Tangerine. I Bowl wanted you to come to that. Down in 54, naturally. And we yeah, really had a record that year, didn't but you? That was, oh, yes, we went 11 to nothing that year. And uh, we played some very fine teams that year, Bradley and Idaho State and Northern Illinois and, and various teams like that, and some of them. You beat by big score, some of them, too. Oh, yes. Well, we beat Morningside that year, won the North Central Conference. We beat them 49 to nothing or something like that. And we beat Fort Hayes that year, won that conference down there. And Bradley came in here undefeated, and we beat them. Idaho State was undefeated and won their conference that year, and we beat them. And I say when we beat them, it was two and three and four touchdowns. Yeah, they weren't, weren't close games, were they? No. Huh? I watched your team that yeah. year, and it was just like a steamroller. But, uh, my, I, I had a great bunch of boys and a great bunch of football. I mean, they were football players. Can you remember some of the really big oh, standouts there? Well, Frank, I think of Bill Engelhardt, Frank of course. Harn, Bill Engelhardt, Steck, uh, uh, Ed Baker and Howard Baker and Simon A. Simon and, and uh, oh, Johnson boys. And, uh, well, the ends was, I think, at that time was... Uh, uh, Dick Cotton and Wayne Malnick and uh, and John Semino, they're all fine in. By now, are we into platooning football? No, no. We're uh, still t pretty oh, much two-way. Oh, yeah, just... Maybe yeah. a little more especially, but well, not a lot. Well, yes, but I don't think we substituted over four or five times in the Tangerine Bowl. Is that right? So they were... I, uh, of course, I had a boy that was just real tops and Amo Raddick. He was a quarterback. Remember. He and Bill used to alternate. Bill would play the first quarter. Uh, Raddick played the second, Bill the third, and Raddick the fourth. See, and uh, they got good rest, and, and they were both uh, leaders in ground gaining in the, in the country that year, and only played a half a game. Was the game say. now getting it a little more balanced between run and pass? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, we passed uh, that year as much as we run. Mm -hmm. In fact, our yards gain in passing wasn't any... About, there was only about five yards or ten yards difference in yards gained passing was running. Is that right? That's what made it great because you can pass and run. If they got up tight on you on, on your running, you'd open up with the pass. The game is opening up more now. Isn't oh, yes. Yeah, well, it's a lot more passing now than, yeah. than running. I mean, even in that years where we got... Yeah, well, we started more opening up even, then. even up type of thing. Yeah, I remember Bill, of course, one of the great quarterbacks we've ever had, you know, in the All-American four different well, UP and AP and, and all those, they all picked him as all American. Bill, the uh, first time I put him in as a quarterback, you know, uh, we had some pass plays. He threw a pass and an intercept. And, uh, of course, we didn't take many yards on it after the interception. It wasn't long he took another interception. He was ready to quit, you know. He didn't want to play. <laughs> he can't throw the ball. I said, Bill, what do you think? You think you're going to be a professional or are you going to go in there and just hit him right on the goal? you think you've got to give yourself a chance and then after that boy he settled down and boy i don't think he had five interceptions the rest of his exactly. years right. and all the rest of his years well that tangerine bowl trip was a really high point for the history of all our sports here at the university yes it really was it uh, it really drew the interest to the university of omaha and it was really quite a trip with the train and the whole oh, bit wasn't it yeah and of course we flew you know we went into chicago and flew from chicago into to Orlando. Didn't a whole bunch come down by train? Oh, yes. And then the, the student body and everybody yeah. else, they came down by train, but we flew in. And, oh, it was it was a real fine trip. It was a very close game, as I remember. Yeah, we played it too close. I mean, who was it you played again? Uh, Eastern uh, Kentucky. Uh -huh. And, of course, the old coach there was a friend of mine. And uh, But uh, we played it too close to the belt. You know, we were all a little shaky. Here we are in a great yeah. big bowl game. Yeah. Bowl, which is a great big probably the biggest crowd the kids yeah, ever well, played in the front the of. Bowl now. Houston and all those yeah. teams are playing there yeah. now, you know. It's just considered it's one of the big bowl games now. But uh, we didn't open up like we should. I, I, we didn't pass as much as we should and so forth. We were playing it too close to the belly, really. Mm -hmm. We should have went out and just played ball, but we were playing it too tight and we were too tense. Uh, but we still got out of it with a 76 yeah, ball game yeah. and to win it. No, um, 55, that's a while ago, but there were many years after that, too. Oh, yes. I uh, think of some of the high points in through there, and then we're going to move into track well, after a while here when you decided to fine. Well, move 50, out of football. In 55, that's 54 team uh, played January of 55. Oh, yeah. The 55 team 
we lost uh, only one game there. You had a lot of those boys back, didn't you? Oh, yes. We lost a few good boys, but we had a lot of them back. And, uh, but uh, we lost one game of Washburn that year. That mm -hmm. stopped our 16-game winning streak, but won the rest of them, beating Bradley and, and Northern Illinois and, and all those. Uh, uh, we had a real good team again that year. Uh, then uh, I started losing some of the boys that were bootstrappers and so forth. And that, I didn't have any tuition help and so forth, and it didn't look like we were going to get any help as far as tuition was concerned. So we started putting pieces together. Well, what happened, uh, if we could have helped our boys or helped go out and recruit after that 54-55 season, we could have got a lot of fine boys. Because you had a good name that yes, year, didn't you? we had you? a real good name. And uh, we had a lot of boys who would write in and want to know if they could come to school and what kind of help we could give them. They were top-notch athletes. But when we told them that uh, we didn't give any tuition or help or anything like that, well, they, they dropped us right then and there because they needed it. Didn't it make it kind of tough to compete? A lot of the schools we were playing by this time had lots of scholarships. Oh, they? yes. Pra practically every team we played had scholarships. Yeah, yeah. Every, well, Eastern Kentucky, they pulled, they, everybody they had there was on scholarships. And we beat them. Yeah. Well, I think that was the wrong idea that we got. Well, if we, we can beat teams without uh, with us having uh, scholarships, why should we need them? Mm -hmm. you know, I mm -hmm. think that's the way it was kind of So it worked to defeat it. the program in a way. It's, it certainly did because it showed later on. When I lost my GI boys, which was getting some help and so forth, I couldn't get anybody in here to come in and play on their own without any help and so forth. So my next year showed that. Uh, gosh, we went and only won one, and then we lost them all practically, mm -hmm. won a couple more. Mm -hmm. uh, and, of course, everybody was a little down on us that time. Well, I figured maybe the only way to do it is get out of football and get somebody else in here. Now, Al Camilla was my assistant yes. coach this time. Yes, good all out. Maybe they, they would give him some tuition help and start building this up. Well, they did. They come along and start giving tuition then. And... Uh, uh, Al, his first year, only won one ball game, won seven, but he had all that tuition help, and he started building it up to where he, he had some real fine seasons. And then he moved into a conference, too, didn't he? Yes, mm -hmm. and he had some real fine seasons because he had the tuition help. But now when you moved out of football, that didn't mean you didn't leave us. You stayed with us for a long, long time after that. They asked and you went back to the track. See, right? I, when I originally came here, Paul, I was track and football coach. Right, right. And then, of course, spring football started coming in, and I couldn't have spring football and track both. So I dropped the track at the time and hung on to football. And then when this seasons come in, the last few seasons weren't too good, then they asked if I'd take over the track again. Mm -hmm. So then I said, well, sure. And, and that's when Al took over and got his, got his help. And so you really went back to track in a way, huh? Yeah, I went back to what I originally was How do you enjoy that? Oh, I enjoy track. I really do. In fact, but I, it's so different, isn't it? It's a different kind of approach. Oh, all around. yes. Well, of course, I, so individual, I had some of the best track men in the country. Yeah, let's country. name some of them. Well, Roger Sayers was, was, was one of the top sprinters in the United States in his day. Yes, And uh, Terry Williams was one of the top sprinters. But Terry, uh, he only lasted a couple of years and didn't like his studies and kind of flunked out a little bit. But then I had Ken Gould, who was one of the top uh, milers. Uh, milers and half milers in yeah. people chase. Yeah. Uh, he was all American, and, and Sayers was all American. And I had uh, some various hurdlers that were all American. In fact, we had the NAIA National Championship in Kansas City. I went down there and took two relay teams down there with some other boys. And we won both national relays, yes, the mile right. relay and the two mile relay. And we won them back to back. What year would that have been? Well, I think yeah. that was 50, wait a minute, 67, 68, somewhere in there. Right Mid in to there. late 60s. Yeah. And, uh, but there is no team or uh, school in the world has won two relays back to no. back. And in that words, I had eight All-Americans. <laughs>